How's everyone doing today? My name is Yupari and I'd like to welcome you to episode 3 of the Realist Portrait Painting series. For this painting we'll be working on a 9 by 12 inch Frederick's linen canvas. Before we begin I thought I'd share with you how I tone my canvas. I get any gray acrylic paint I can get my hands on. I believe Liquitex is preferred, but this is an artist loft gray. So I get a brush, dip it into some water, and put it on top of the uh, acrylic paint. Uh, now this isn't an exacting science, I just like the acrylic to be kind of thin so that I can evenly distribute it onto the canvas. I don't want it to be completely thick. I don't want the acrylic to be like straight acrylic with no water added to it because then the canvas will be rather slick so that's why I go with a more a thinned out acrylic paint. Once the acrylic paint is evenly applied I will wait about an hour or so for the canvas to dry before I can start to paint. For my palette I use three dots of titanium white, three dots of flake white replacement. Now I make separate dots just to keep the whites clean. Uh, for the colors from left to right, I have Burnt Umber, Alizarin Crimson, Cadmium Red Light, Cadmium Orange, Yellow Ochre, Cadmium Yellow, Sap Green, Ultramarine Blue, and Ivory Black. There are four things we want to get out of the first pass. Accurate placement of the features, resolved light and shadow shapes, thinly painted indications of form, and large value relationships. Like I mentioned before in previous videos, the secret to realist portrait painting is drawing and the secret to drawing is usage of shapes. When I start out I want to know where my top and bottom most areas of the face are going to be and what I want is to encapsulate the entire structure of the head in just a few lines as I've indicated already. I don't want these lines to be uh, specific outlines but rather I want them to encapsulate the whole structure of the head into just a few simple lines. We want to look at the big picture. We want to look at the big shapes. Uh, but what does that mean? That means that we want to look at the largest, most simple shapes giving the dimension and the direction of which the structure we're looking at is in space, as you can see there, aligned with the picture. Once we have the big outside shape established, we want to find our center line. The center line of the head gives the direction at which the head is turned and we want to find the axes of the face. So what I just indicated there was the axis of the eyes. Along with the axis of the eyes we will have the axis of the nose and the axis of the mouth. Now it's not a mark that you want to make and then leave. It's a mark that is an indication so it is getting you to the direction in which you want to go. You can bounce your eyes back and forth from the model to your picture as you can see here outlined. You can tell that the distance from the eyes to the nose is a little bit greater than the distance from say the nose to the mouth. Um, but these are observations that we make and then we make our marks. We have to start with something. We don't want to be so afraid to make marks in the beginning 
that we end up hating the process. We want to enjoy what we're doing. So don't make your marks with fear. Just make your indications as freely and gesturally as possible and then work with that. In addition to the big shapes, we have also our shadow shapes. Depending on the light source that you're using, shadow shapes can be another useful tool to indicate early on to help you with your general proportions and placements. Just having simple light and shadow shapes helps you see your proportions and see the placements of things in space. Um, when we work with big shapes, we want to go from general to specific. That means that we want to start with anything. We want to start with the anybody and then we work the anybody into the somebody. So we are using information that we're gathering using our eyesight and placing it down on the canvas but we're making indications that are general and are broad in the beginning but we want our shapes to be clear you can clearly see the distinction between the light in the face and the shadow on the face and you can differentiate the light shapes from the face and the hair and the cast shadow of the head now there's nothing set in stone here as I'm working away around the canvas I'm establishing my large shapes in order to gauge them and use those shapes to draw more accurate shapes but how do we do that I'm relating the points from the leftmost portion of each feature to the rightmost portion of each feature. So I'm using this with the eye to tell me that the corner of the mouth is further left than the corner of the eye on the picture plane. Now if we look at the corner of the nose, it's also left to the corner of the eye but it's further left and if we look at the horizontal we can see the angle between the eyes. Here are the points of relation on the actual painting. When I put this in practice I actually just use my brush as a horizontal or vertical line and I do this multiple times throughout the drawing process just to check my horizontals and my verticals relative to each other. Though we're now getting into color, I don't want to think about this as a color painting, but rather I want to think about this as a drawing tool. Remember that the first pass on your painting, on your realist portrait painting, has to be completely drawing. You have to have at least 98% of your mind focused on drawing. So what I'm doing is I'm mixing up a mixture of cadmium orange, white, burnt umber, and some alizarin crimson to get a drawing color and I'm going to use this to lightly scumble on some light values on the face. Allow me to reiterate the goals of the first pass. So the goals are accurate placement of the features, resolved light and shadow shapes, thinly painted indications of form, and large value relationships. Thus far, we have somewhat accurately placed the features and we have somewhat resolved the light and the shadow shapes 
So now what we're doing is we're thinly painting the indications of form, which means I'm filling out the planes of the face with the this thin wash of paint. I'm not trying to render by any means, and I'm not going to try to render at all in the first sitting. Um, now it's not a hard set rule. If you want to render in the first sitting, you can render some things, and I probably will with this one. But to make the most use out of the first pass on any realist painting that you're going to work on in multiple sittings, you really just want to have accurate light and shadow shapes, accurately placed features, and some indications of form. That's all you really need. As I'm making these indications of form, I'd like to talk a little bit about the the idea of stylization in realist painting. I don't want to get too off topic, but it, there seems to be this um, this mindset in the art community that one needs to find their own voice, one needs to stylize in a way, or uh, how do I put it, one needs to exaggerate certain things, and you can do that and still create a realist painting. You can do that and still have your light and shadow shapes in check and follow the methods that the old masters did. And the reason that that's even possible is the same reason that we have our own handwriting. If you think about it, everyone in grade school is taught how to write and we all write using the same languages but we all have different handwriting and that handwriting is something that is even portrayed in the way we paint the way we move the brush or how we connect lines from one to another Back to the indications of form. So I have indicated the light plane of the cheekbone. I have the light plane of the eyelids facing the, the light. I have the light planes of the forehead. And I have the darker values as the face starts to curve into the shadow to the to the model's right side and I have the darker values or darker local values for the lips and the nose they are also warmer in color as you can see but as I mentioned before I'm strictly keeping myself mostly tuned to the values. On the palette right now I'm mixing up a, a light middle value that's a tad bit cool um, and then a darker middle value that's also a little bit cool kind of greenish. Um, I'm mixing them side by side on the palette as the white of the eye, known as the sclera, and the dark of the eye, the iris region. So I premixed it on my palette so that I could get a value relationship before I put it on the canvas. So now as I put it on the canvas, I'm still going to lightly scumble the color onto the canvas.
painting is all about gauging relationships. As I mentioned earlier, with our points of relation, we were able to gauge distances and angles between points using horizontal and vertical lines. And with value, it's the same kind of thing. We can't have a light without a dark. We can relate values to one another. And the same kind of thought process eventually will be understood with color. Colors can be seen in relation to one another. But colors are completely useless unless we know how to gauge values properly first. In this clip, I started to introduce more values and coincidentally colors into the eyes. Uh, but then I realized that it'd be uh, kind of confusing if I if I left it in color. So I used the black and white filter to show you that even though I'm using color and paint, I'm still treating this like a drawing. I'm thinking about proportion, placement, and value in space. I'm not thinking at all about what kind of color is this? Is it like a pinkish, purplish, orangish, whatever? It could be any color. I could have made the model's eyes like a brilliant purple. And if the values still worked, then you wouldn't even know because I have this filter on and to you it appears as a charcoal drawing and that's what we should have in our mind that this is a drawing whenever making corrections in a realist painting as um, I'm going to have to correct the ear I have it too far to the right side of the canvas um, so whenever making corrections, it's useful to apply an Alla Prima painting style to make these corrections. It doesn't always have to be this way. If the painting was dry, then I would probably use some charcoal on it and draw out the accurate placement. But while it's wet, I might as well take advantage and paint the big shape of the hair and use that to carve into the side of the face and get the more accurate shape of the ear which should be not as far off onto the canvas. This is a perfect example of why we want to keep our shapes simple in the first pass because Something like that can happen. You can have a feature off its axis or something too far off. And for me, that was beneficial to keep the ear at a simple shape stage because moving it to the left was not a life-changing event. Using a mixture of alizarin crimson and some burnt umber, I'll be mixing up the value for the background. Since this is the first pass, I want my paint to be applied uh, rather thin. So I don't, I don't want it to be extremely runny so that it runs across the canvas, but I want it to be thin in application so that my the next layers that I apply, I can use more and more paint. Now for the most part I have the large value relationships established. I'm using the tone of the canvas to stand in for the the values of the the chair 
and the clothing that the model's wearing. Now I know the clothing is light, but to me the most important values were the values of the, the face, the hair, the background, and the chair. So again, the goals were to accurately place the features, which we did for the most part, with the exception of the ear. We resolved the light and shadow shapes. We thinly painted the indications of the form. And last but not least, we established the large value relationships. This painting is now ready for me to set it aside for a couple days and let it dry and we'll start again on the next pass. I should also note the total duration of this painting was about two and a half hours. Uh, now my sittings usually range from two and a half hours to three and a half hours, but three and a half would probably be the most. I'd like to thank you for watching this week's portrait painting demonstration. Stay tuned for next week's installment on my Realist Portrait Painting series where we continue on to episode 4 and we push the forms and push the color a little bit further on this painting. Thanks again.